Hello, cancer fans. So it's been a really long time since I made a video. Um, you know, I really haven't really had much to say. Um, we went and saw um, the two doctors, one of the, um, the liver surgeon and the colon surgeon. They both gave me the thumbs up, said that the, um, everything seems to be healing up fine. Uh, even though I'm in a lot more pain than uh, than either one of them are are accepting or whatever, um, so I'm taking a half of a hydrocodone in the morning and a half of a hydrocodone at night, and that seems to be taking care of things pretty good. So just to kind of recap everything, so it's uh back in 2021, probably March of 2021, I started to lose weight. Um, I didn't even realize that I was losing weight until my wife told me um, that I was losing weight. So, um, so we, uh, I hopped on the scale and I had lost about, um, about 50 pounds. Um, I could actually take my hands and go around my, my forearms, you know? Um, so I, I had lost a lot of weight. Um, also I was not eating. Um, and then it got to about um, about G the middle of June in 2021. And if I ate anything but a little tiny bit, it would make me throw up. So I was, uh, I couldn't keep food down. Um, and then in July, at uh, the, the 1st of July, 2021, I came home from work um, and I couldn't even lift my arms up. I couldn't eat. I couldn't lift my arms up. I was, had lost... Uh, like 60 pounds. Um, I was just in terrible, terrible shape. I was throwing up every time I would eat any kind of a food. Um, I didn't have an appetite. I could also do this thing with my liver, which I wasn't sure if it was my liver at the time. I didn't really, I'm not that really, from, wasn't that familiar with the inside organs and everything, but I could push on the top of my liver and it would pop out at the bottom. It was like a teeter totter. I could push at the bottom and the top would pop up and I could like teeter totter my liver back and forth. And that was pretty weird. I, uh, that was pretty scary. So we went to the emergency room. And my wife finally convinced me. Um, I thought I thought I was going to die on July 1st. Um, yeah, I thought I was going to die. I, I, I thought this is what it's like when you're going to die. I could, I, I, there was, um, so I tried to eat on July 1st. After I got home from work, I tried to eat dinner. I sat down on the floor next to the couch on the coffee at the coffee table and I took a couple bites of food and it just made me nauseous and made me sick and I um, leaned back and I laid back on the floor and I could see stars. I don't know if ever, anybody's ever seen stars but it's just like it shows in the cartoons little stars flying around um, and it freaked me out. I'd never seen stars before and um, so I thought I was gonna die. Um, so I told Deanna you know I think um, I think maybe we should go to the hospital. And so I was thinking we were going to make an appointment for a doctor. Um, but nope, she um, packed up everything and hauled me off to the emergency room. The doctor in the emergency room, they did some bunch of tests and everything. And they told me that I had tumors in my liver and in my colon. So at that point, we, we didn't know whether it was cancer or what was going on. Um, and... Uh, and so we had to do some follow-up uh, tests and stuff like that after we uh, we had to leave the emergency room. And uh, and about a week later, I was admitted to an actual hospital. Um, and that's when they did the test that said that it was cancer, um, advanced stage four colon cancer is what they said it was. Because um, the tumors were extremely big. Um, it had metastasized to my liver. Um, and at that time, we, um, you know, we, everything was new to us. So we Googled the, you know, advanced stage four colon cancer. And the first thing that pops up is where it says that um, the five-year survival rate after the time of diagnosis, um, five years, is like 14 or 16%. So 84, 84 percent of the people or whatever um, die within five years. So that was a shocker. You know, we were not expecting any of that. Um, so that was pretty scary. 
Um, so we immediately started doing chemo. We got ourselves a, um, a good, uh, a good uh, oncologist. Uh, we went to Ironwood Cancer Center here in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and uh, we started doing um, chemo, chemotherapy. And I did six months of chemo. That was the F Firefox, I think it's called. It's heavy duty chemo. Um, it gave me um, neuropathy in my fingers and my my hands and my my feet, and that's horrible. Um, you know, it's it's better than death, but um, the tingling and the numbness uh, makes it hard to really do anything with your with your fingers. Um, the the neuropathy in my feet uh, makes it feel like I'm walking around with blocks of ice on my feet. Um, so. Uh, so we did the six months of chemo, and I didn't feel any neuropathy up until about the last couple um, chemo sessions. And we went in, we told him, the, the, the oncologist, that um, it was starting to get tingly because he would ask me before every single um, session, are your feet getting tingly? Are your hands getting tingly? And I hadn't experienced any tingling up until like the, the right till you're right at the end. So this neuropathy lasts from three to five months, well, no, that, that it, it reaches its peak from three to five months after your last um, fair, Firefox or whatever it's called, after your last chemo. Um, all chemo doesn't cause it, um, just certain chemo. Um, so that was the chemo that I was getting is the ones that caused that, the neuropathy. So I had neuropathy in my feet and in my hands um, the last couple of times, I started, they started to tingle. Um, and it, it reaches its peak from three to five months um, after your last chemo session. So I still have a few weeks before my three months is, uh, I think I have like a month before my three months is over. And then hopefully it'll start getting better. Um, he did give us um, gabapentin and that definitely reduces the, the, the symptoms of neuropathy. Before, um, it always felt like my fingers and my hand, my feet were freezing cold. Um, like I said, it felt like I was walking around with blocks of ice on my feet. My fingers, um, well, not only that, but I would go try to go to sleep at night. And it felt like I was, I, I, don't, I don't know what, um, uh, you know, like drug addicts who have well, withdrawals. I don't know what they go through. But I would imagine I've heard skin crawling. It felt like my skin was crawling. Um, it was really hard to fall asleep. I would have to really like do the Vulcan mind trick where I like imagine myself somewhere else away from my body. And I would try to forget about all of the weird skin crawling and tingling and everything that was going on. And um, then I could fall asleep. So anyways, um, got the uh, went through the six months of chemo. And then um, they did a, a PET scan. The PET scan showed that the tumor on my on my liver was reduced by about um, by quite a bit, by like uh, three fifths. It was about a two fifths the size, or one fifth somewhere in there, the size that it was originally. So it had shrank tons. The tumor on my colon not so much. The tumor on my colon hadn't hardly shrank at all. Um, they're really tough um, colon tumor. It was not, it was, you know, fighting back. It was not wanting to shrink. It was not wanting to um, cooperate at all. So the oncologist said, that's, you know, you, you, you need to meet with a um, liver surgeon and with a colon surgeon and see what they have to say. Try to get someone to do some, to do your surgery. So we got, um, got a, we went first to the liver surgeon we found a good liver surgeon. We had a little bit of trouble with our insurance company. Um, they were trying to give us a, just some of the most ridiculous uh, doctors that were on the list of doctors that we had to choose from. Most of them were like um, anesthesiologists, um, a gynecologist. Uh, none of them were like liver surgeons, right? So that was a big problem. We didn't want to just have anybody cutting into my liver and doing that, which I'm glad now that we didn't because I had enough complications with a experienced, really good liver surgeon. I can't even imagine if I would have had a, you know, someone who's done only a half a dozen liver surgeries in their entire life or whatever. Um, so anyways, um, we found a really good liver surgeon. We went in there 
he um, got us lined up with a good colon surgeon and uh, and they scheduled the surgeries the, the we went to see the liver surgeon the next day he had a colon surgeon he had the sur sur surgery scheduled he had all of our tests scheduled everything was scheduled everything was ready to go we didn't have to think about it again until um, the 1st of February, which is when I went in to get my surgery. So on the 1st of February, I went in to get my surgery. Um, it took nine hours of surgery. Um, I imagine most of it was closing it up. I have this huge scar, uh, cut down in the middle of my stomach. Um, I guess they didn't want to cut off to the side because then they would have had to cut through a bunch of muscle and stuff. So they cut right down the center. They kind of did a little U-turn around my belly button and then down um, so the, the whole incision is about 10 inches. Um, and then I also had to have a drain because when they take that much of your colon or your liver out, it's really hard to get all of the, um, all of the tubes that, um, that the bile flows through your liver produces bile. And they also removed my gallbladder. Um, sorry, my wife's phone is ringing. Um, yeah, so they, and they, so they removed, they removed, um, about a third of my liver. They removed my gallbladder because they needed to remove the part of my liver that my gallbladder was attached to. And there was just no, there's really not any other way around it. They have to do it that way. Um, so they removed my gallbladder. Um, a third of my liver, and then they removed about a six inch section of my colon, my lower colon. Um, so, um, yeah, they had, I had to have a drain because it's really hard to close up all of the little tubes and everything that, that the bile flows through. Um, and uh, it actually got pretty bad when I was in the hospital. We had to do kind of an emergency pro procedure where they went in and they put a stint in my small intestine where the tubes go from my liver to my small intestine. Um, I guess the liver has like sandy stuff in it and it, and that sandy stuff had plugged up all the holes. So the bile was leaking into my um, stomach cavity and it hurts when that happens too, let me tell you. Um, so they had to put a stint in there, which is a little tube, a little hard tube um, that, that keeps that... Um, that uh, pathway opens so that the bile goes from my liver to my small intestine instead of going into my um, stomach cavity. It just relieves that pressure. It makes it so it easily flows. Um, so I had a lot of issues with bile in my um, stomach cavity because even though they put that in there, there was still some bile leaking into my stomach cavity and it hurts, um, especially, uh, you know, uh, it, it takes a while for it to heal up. Um, so, um, that, uh, I think the bile is pretty much stopped now. Um, I also had to go to the emergency room after I got, after I returned home from the surgery, after I finally got home, I have, I've had no problems with the incision, like the cut up the middle of my stomach. Um, the colon, um, seems to be, everything is working perfect there. The surgery was a success. Um, they tested, um, around the parts that they cut off. I believe it's called the, um, the, uh, I forget what it's called, but they, they tested the, the sides, you know, around where they cut the the parts out and those all tested negative for cancer. Um, so, um, theoretically I am cancer free now. Um, so I no longer have cancer. Um, but I had, did have a complication, um, where when I would lay down to go to bed at night, um, I was finding it really hard to breathe. Um, the, this pain would start at the bottom of my, my right lung and it would work its way up all the way to the top of my right lung. And when it would get up to the top here, I could only take little tiny short breaths and it was kind of scary. Um, so we, we had to go to the emergency room for that. Um, I dealt with it one night. Um, and then the, the next night, cause I was hoping that it would just go away. Um, but then the next night it happened again and Deanna made me go to the emergency room. And so I spent like a week in the freaking hospital for that. And um, it turns out that I was extremely constipated. My whole colon was full. 
um, and it was putting pressure on my liver and causing all just all kinds of issues and swelling and things like that were causing um, things to push up against my right lung and then that was causing liquid to form around my lung and then that was causing all the problems. So um, that has since been taken care of. I no longer am constipated. Um, I uh, no longer have the pain. You know, when I, when I had that, that liquid around my lung, I could take a deep breath and it almost sounded like there was um, Rice Krispies or something getting crunched in my lung. I could feel it and I could hear it and um, just kind of a crunchy sound. Um, so that's all gone now. All of the pain is gone. I can sleep just fine. Um, I do still sleep up just because it's, I don't want to deal with it. You know, I don't want it to come back. My liver is still healing. Everything's still healing. Um, but uh, but I have been, uh, like in the middle of the night, I'll wake up and I'm laying flat on the bed and I don't have any issues with pain or anything like that or crunchy noises in my lung. So I've had my, my surgery. Um, I had my surgery February 11th. It is now... March, uh, the late, it's late March. I don't even know what the date is. I, um, it's, it's late March. Um, yeah, I feel good. Um, I, the, the, the pain was pretty extreme. The, I, I, I tell you what, my, um, colon surgeon is pretty hardcore. He, I, I, he kept, he kept saying, you know, I felt, I felt like I was a drug addict or something in there because I, I was in pain and I wanted pain meds because I couldn't sleep at night. So I was, so I ended up staying awake all night until I finally was so exhausted that I would fall asleep. And the problem with that is that um, if you, if you've ever been in the hospital, they come in and they test you in the middle of the night. You know, there's like four times during, during the night when they come in and test you and they wake you up. So if you're not falling asleep at a normal time, um, and then they're coming in and testing you, you, you know, you finally do fall asleep and then they come in and start testing you and stuff. You don't get, you don't hardly get any sleep. And then, um, and not only that, but hospitals are cold. Um, they keep it really cold in there for whatever reason. I don't know, but it's drafty in there. It's cold. And I was in pain and I could not convince the guy who was in charge of my pain meds that I was in pain. And, um, I felt like I was a drug addict trying to convince somebody that I needed drugs. Um, and we never did get any, any good pain meds. Um, I was constantly in pain when I was in there. So I was without, basically without pain meds. I was, I was on ibuprofen and acetaminophen, um, almost the entire time that I was in there. And anybody who's ever had a third of their, their liver cut out and a section of their colon, you know, four or 800 milligrams of acetaminophen, four or 800 milligrams of ibuprofen is not enough. Um, I was in misery the entire time that I was in there. So it was just a big, messy thing there. I was super glad to be out. And one of the first things that we did when I was out, when I got out of there, is we went to see my oncologist. And I told him, listen, I'm in a lot of pain. I need pain meds. And he immediately prescribed me hydrocodone. Um, so I've been taking a half of a hydrocodone in the morning, a half of a hydrocodone at night. And it, uh, it takes enough of the pain away so that I'm not in misery. Um, and I feel like I can, you know, have a normal life, uh, at least be normal until everything's healed up. Um, so in the middle of the day, there's really no pain meds that are, that are doing their thing, you know, because the, the hydrocodone doesn't last forever. It only lasts like four hours or so. So in the middle of the day, I'm kind of without pain meds. So I can kind of feel where I'm at with all the pain. And there's still quite a bit of pain. Um, but there is not nearly as much pain as there was before. So the pain is getting less and less. Um, I definitely am healing. Um, I'm getting healed up because before, like I would lay in bed and I would have to move around in bed and it was painful. It was hard to move around in bed. Not so hard anymore. I can lay on my left side, my right side, my back, my stomach. I can lay on any side and it's not um, painful at all. Sometimes I get this weird feeling where the stint was put in, where it feels kind of like burning. Um, I guess that's, I don't know what that is. I, I have no idea, but i um, certainly not going to go to the emergency room because I feel a weird burning thing. It doesn't seem to, it's not, it's not like the, nor the normal. It's very rare that it happens, but every once in a while I'll feel this weird burning, like, um, like bile or something, you know, um, pouring into my 
intestine. So anyways, um, got, had the surgery done. I'm, I'm healing up good. Um, as far as I know, I'm cancer free right now, but of course I won't know until we have uh, some good tests. I don't think a CAT scan really is a very good indicator because it's so hard to look through all of the images um, and see where everything is. I think the PET scan is really the only um, scan that really does, uh, that really tells you where you're at with the cancer. Um, I, uh, next week I go to see my oncologist again and he wants to start me on um, like the follow-up chemotherapy just in case there's any loose um, cancer floating around in my bloodstream or whatever trying to form in my lungs or anything like that. This, um, this follow-up chemo should kill all the wandering chem uh, cancers um, and uh, and uh, so I'll probably do that for a few months and then and then I'll get a PET scan and see where we're at. So we really won't know anything until that PET scan happens as far as you know hopefully um, when they were doing the surgery they sucked it all out of me and there's not anything floating around in there. There's not any in my lungs you know I've I can take deep breaths, no problem. I don't feel any pain. I don't feel any tinkle, tickling. I don't feel any, you know, I don't have any urge to cough. Um, uh, you know, I feel really good. I feel like I really lucked out. Um, you know, I looks like I'm part of that 14% or 16% um, that's going to live uh, through it. I, hopefully, you know, um, we, uh, you know, we have this YouTube, pay, uh, YouTube site and um, there's been so many people who have uh, you know, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of people who have given sad stories, you know, their husbands have died, or their kids have died, or their, um, you know, their boyfriends have died, or, um, or they're, they are, um, you know, uh, terminal, their, their cancer has turned terminal, or, they, you know, there's tons and tons and tons of horror stories. But there are also the stories where people have been um, years after surgery, with no recurrence of uh, chemo, you know, but both of my parents died from cancer. Um, all of us kids smoke. My, my, I have one brother um, that doesn't smoke. My sister smokes, my other brother smokes, and I smoked. My Both my parents smoked. Um, so when I got diagnosed with cancer, when actually, um, I think we went back on July 7th is when we were, when I was admitted into the hospital. Um, from that day forward, I have not smoked a cigarette. And that's what my parents couldn't do. Um, they couldn't quit smoking. And I know that it's really hard. And, um, you know, that kind of goes along with the whole thing, my whole story. You know, just how lucky I've been with everything. Everything is just kind of lined right up and just worked its, worked worked out in my favor. Because I went into the hospital and I was in there um, uh, when I went to the emergency room. Uh, I was admitted, well, we went to the emergency room July 1st, and then we left and went back to the emergency room again, like on July 7th. And I was in there for like a week or so, something like that. And that's when they diagnosed me and they took, you know, they took the core samples or whatever of my liver tumor and my, they tried to give me a colonoscopy and just all that stuff when really all the stuff, um, when they really kind of fine tuned and found out exactly what was wrong with me and all that. But I was in the hospital long enough that, um, that I could, that when I, when I left the hospital, I, all of the, all of the real, um, desire to smoke was gone. I had already had all the withdrawals and everything. And plus my wife said, if you don't quit smoking, I'm going to leave you because I'm not going to stay with you and watch you kill yourself with cigarettes. So, you know, I, after, after being in the hospital for, for like seven days or whatever it was, I think it might have been even longer than seven days. Um, but when I left the hospital, I still had a desire to smoke. You know, when we drove by the a Circle K gas station, um, I was like, ooh, boy, we could swing by there and grab a pack of smokes and I'll just have one cigarette, you know. Um, but nope, um, didn't do it, didn't have that cigarette. And that's where my parents um, weren't so lucky, you know, the, you know, um, for one thing, Deanna doesn't smoke, so there's nobody that smokes in this household. Um, so when I was trying not to smoke, it wasn't that hard not have when I didn't have cigarettes around. But for both my parents, well, for my dad, he had he died first. He had cancer first. Um, he um, when he was going through all his stuff, my mom still smoked, 
and quitting smoking is super hard. You know, I wish my parents were still here, obviously. Um, they died before my son was born, so they never met my son. Um, but cigarettes are horrible. They're, um, you know, I, 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 for, for a while there, I was really angry at them because they didn't quit drinking, they did quit smoking, they didn't quit doing the things that they needed to do to, to help them increase their chances to live. And I wanted them to live. I wanted, you know. Um, but anyways, um, so my parents had both died from cancer. Um, luckily, like I said, everything just kind of worked out so that it wasn't that hard. You know, you can't smoke when you're in the hospital. Um, so, uh, I don't know, it just it worked out so that it wasn't that hard. You know, I have a 10-year-old son who I really wanted to live for. I didn't want to die and leave him um, without a dad. I want to be around when he grows up and he has a family. I want to meet my grandkids, and I want to be a dad, and I want to be a husband. And, you know, I have a lot of things to live for, and um, and they all were way more important to me than smoking. So I just kind of got lucky there. Um I got lucky the where where the where my colon tumor was because it was in my lower colon, but it didn't hit my rectum, so so they could cut the the tumor out, and I and then I didn't need like a pouch or a bag or anything like that. Um, the they just cut it out and sewed it back together, and I and now I just have six inches less of my large large intestine or my colon, um, where my liver um, you know livers grow back. So when they needed to cut out a third of my liver, um, you know, it's extremely painful and it was not um, fun, but, um, you know, that's, uh, could have been a lot worse. Um, so I just, I got, I guess I just got lucky, you know, um, and the chemo did, did great on my liver tumor. Didn't, like I said, it didn't do much for my colon tumor, but that's fine. You know, they were going to cut that section of my colon out anyways. Um, so the colon tumor didn't really matter. It was ma mainly just the liver tumor because when I was first diagnosed, the liver tumor was freaking huge. It was like, uh, I think uh, Deanna said, or somebody said 10 centimeters or something like that. It was pretty big um, in there and you could feel it. You know, I, like I said, I could teeter totter my liver back and forth. Um, so now um, I've, I believe that I'm cancer free. So you know, now that I'm cancer free, I'm getting better and better every day. What do I make videos about? You know, uh, um, I don't have do the doctor visits. I, I did go to two doctor visits. Um, they were basically uneventful. Um, they just said, you know, uh, your tests all look good. Um, they, you know, poked me with their fingers and around all my scars and all my stuff. And they said, everything looks great. Um, so um, there's no weird swelling. There's no weird... But I'll tell you what, um, I was extremely constipated, um, actually up until today, this morning, well, about three mornings ago, I probably went to the bathroom number two, like 15 times that morning. And I thought that's gotta be it. Everything's gotta be out of my colon. Now I gotta be empty. Um, I'm good. This morning I went to the bathroom for like an hour. Like I would lean forward and go to the bathroom. Then I would lean backwards and go to the bathroom. I would lean forward and go to, and this went on for like an hour. And let me tell you, that was the most I have ever gone to number two in my entire life. Um, without going into too much detail, it was a lot. Um, and then after all, after I thought it was all over, I stood up and I immediately had to sit right back down and I went some more. Um, then I went and Deanna was out working and she's making a little garden out in the backyard. Um, so I went and I was going to go tell Deanna about it. Actually, I did. I just started telling her about it and I immediately had to run back into the house, into the bathroom. Um, so that's finally over, even though I can feel like I still have to go to the bathroom a little bit, but nothing like I was before. So anyways, that, that was kind of a weird thing where I went to the bathroom so much that's the most I've ever gone in, in my entire life. I can say that with all certainty, with no uncertainty, that that is for sure the most that I've ever gone in my entire life. Um, so anyways, I'm gaining back some weight. I got, I'm got i at about 145 now. I think about 170, 165, 170 is my, um, has been my natural weight, my 
my weight that I just seem to be at or whatever without, uh, it doesn't really fluctuate. I don't have to try to stay at that weight. It just, that's what I, the weight that I'm at. Um, but that's also the weight that I was at when I was smoking. So who knows what weight I'll be at now. Um, hopefully I'll be at a, a little bit more because that was, that was still kind of skinny. Um, let's see. Um, so now right now I'm taking, um, all kinds of stuff. Uh, when Deanna gives me my pills, um, it's like we, we, we use the little cups like uh, for the like cough syrup and stuff like they give you at the hospital when you're taking the pills. And my cup is like half full. Um, it's like it's like a meal. Um, so I know there's a, there's acetaminophen in there. Um, so I'm taking a, I'm taking pills twice a day. Um, I'm taking a half of a hydrocodone. I think it's uh 10 milligrams. Yeah, it's 10 milligrams of hydrocodone. I don't know. It's it's 10 milligrams of the pain killing drug. And then there's also, um, I think, acetaminophen in there. Um, so that there's that. I take an, So I'm taking five milligrams of acetaminophen, or excuse me, of hydrocodone in the morning. And then I'm taking uh, five at night. Um, I think I'm taking acetaminophen twice a day, once in the morning, once at night. I'm taking this um, thing that's supposed to make it so that you're, so that I empty my liver, or excuse me, I empty my um, uh, kidneys or whatever. When I go to the bathroom, when I pee, um, I empty myself. But I'll tell you what, so before the surgery, when I would pee, it was a little trickle. Like it would sometimes take me like 45 seconds or a minute or more to do a full pee where I would stand there and wait and wait and wait while it was just trickling down, um, trickling into the toilet. But now it's like a normal, normal pee stream. I don't know whether the tumors were pushing up against the tube. That it, I'm not, I, I, I don't know the stuff, but, but anyways, that's returned to normal. So I'm pretty happy about that. Um, cause that was kind of something that worried me. Another thing is that I thought that there were two tumors in my lower colon. Um, if you've watched any of my other videos, um, I was convinced that the, um, PET scans showed two tumors in my lower colon. Turns out there was only one and they removed it. The doctor removed it. Um, so, uh, that was one thing that was pretty good. Uh, that I was worried about. Um, you know, I, I was kind of one of the times that it made me cry. Um, when I got home, um, it was I was still in a lot of pain. We had to have kind of a sterile environment, so I was sleeping in the game room. We moved a mattress in there, and um, that's where I was kind of camped out. We have the big TV in there and everything. So, um, But I was in a lot of pain, so it wasn't like fun or anything. It was I'm pretty miserable. But I also didn't have my son come over until... I didn't see my son for about um, a month, and uh, when he came when he came over, um, you know, it just kind of all kind of dawned on me at once while we were sitting there talking. I said, you know, um, you know, a month ago we were worried that I wasn't even going to live through all this stuff, that I was going to die, you know, I mean, you know, with the fourteen percent survival rate and uh, and all of that stuff, you know, when people die in surgery, I, you know, I'd never had surgery before and I was scared of surgery, and. Um, you know, I don't know what the percentage was of people who die, but, you know, between the cancer and five-year survival rate and the surgery and all that stuff, you know, I figured my chances of dying were like 50-50, <laughs> which obviously they were not that bad. But, you know, it was scary. I was I was, uh, was worried, scared that I was going to be dead pretty soon. And so, I, you know, I, you know, we were talking and I said, you know, I look at it. I, I lived through it. I'm alive. Um, and then... Um, and then we also, you know, he, he said, you know, and also I don't have cancer anymore. They, 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 the surgeons went in and they removed all the cancer. So I lived through the surgery and through the cancer. I'm no, I no longer have cancer. Hopefully, you know, we'll find out in a few months. Um, but um, that is the, you know, that's what, that's what the surgeons think. And that's what my oncologist thinks is that the, the cancer is gone. Um, I feel I'm feeling better and better every day. Um you know, so that's one of the things that made me cry is that we were sitting there talking and I realized 
I lived through it. I'm alive and I no longer have cancer. Um, those are the two huge things. And I don't smoke anymore. You know, that's like a huge thing. Um, if not for health purposes, for financial purposes, you know, smoking is expensive. Um, so yeah, just a, just a really great, um, great time. Um, really super happy and thankful, you know, and, and, uh, and I can't thank, there's so many people um, who follow our YouTube videos um, who are, um, you know, they've become a huge part of our life. You know, there's so much encouragement and so much um, help. You know, people donated money through GoFundMe and PayPal. They've sent us gifts. You know, I have a, a um, I don't know what you call it. It's like where you knit the yarn. I'm, I'm, my feet are covered up with a, with a, a blanket that someone mailed us. I, I know who mailed it to us. I just can't think of it right now. But, um, you know, it's a beautiful um, Afghan, I think it's called. Um, but, you know, just, uh, just so much encouragement, so much help. You know, um, we definitely couldn't have done it um, without all the help. I, I don't know where we would be. You know, people have donated money um, and, you know, we needed that. Uh, you know, I, I was not expecting when, it, when all this first happened, when we went to see the oncologist, he told me, you cannot work construction. Um, you have to find a different um, occupation, um, at least until all of the cancer is over. And, and at that time, um, you know, you could tell he was not expecting me to live. You know, I was at 118 pounds or 115 pounds. Um, I had smoked for like 40 years. Um, he was fully expecting me to be just one of those, one of those numbers of people who die. Um, you, he could tell, and it's funny because everybody always, everybody was always so sorry. You know, I'm so sorry. And, um, everybody acted like I was already dead. Um, so that was kind of discouraging, but the people on our YouTube channel never, you know, there was a few people that we blacklisted because they're not nice, but everyone was so encouraging and they had so many, so many people had great stories and, um, uh, stories of people who did survive stories of people who were part of that 14%. And the more, the more it went on and the more we posted videos and the more that people commented and, um, you know, people who are, I guess you could say they're friends of ours now. Um, but the more that people commented, the more confidence, um, I had that I was going to beat this and I was going to survive and I was going to be part of that percentage of the people who, um, survived. And, um, you know, don't get me wrong. Um, like my, like our, the liver surgeon said, he said, you're not out of the woods. He said, you need to be diligent the rest of your life. He said, you need to be careful. Um, don't smoke. Don't drink. Don't do all these things that you know are bad for you. He's like, if you hear that little voice in your head telling you this is not good for me, don't do it. Um, he said that the people, those are the people that live. Those are the people that survive and that live a long time. So, um, so you know, we're, we're not out of the woods yet and we never will be. But um, it was nice to have all of the encouragement, all of the, you know, it's like a, one day it's me and Deanna and Liam and Ethan. And then, uh, you know, a couple months later, we have a thousand friends that are encouraging and um, you know, Anyways, um, I really appreciate all of the, all of the kindness, you know, like I said, you know, um, when I, when all this first happened, I told my employer or not my employer because I was a, a subcontracting, uh, I was an independent contractor and I was doing maintenance for a couple different companies and I told them it'll be about a month. Um, and that was in July of 2021. It is m late March right now. Um, so it's been, what is it, July, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, nine months. It's been nine months since I worked. Um, so we could not have done it without the donations and without the, um, 
yeah, we couldn't have done it without the donations uh, to the GoFundMe and stuff. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, we've been scraping by, but it was just enough. Um, just like everything else with this whole thing, um, we had we have had just enough to make it, um, and we made it. We're through to the other side. Um, the um, colon surgeon said um, that um, I'll probably be able to go to work back to work in a week or excuse me in a month. Um, you know, like I said, my my when we first when all this first started, we went to the colon surgeon. He said you need to change your occupation um, because of the way that muscles heal. Um, you they you know uh, because of the way that your muscles heal. You do, uh, construction does not um, lend itself very well to um, fighting chemo and uh, fighting cancer. Um, what ha uh, your body needs all of that to fight the cancer and to keep healing from the chemotherapy. Um, so you so the construction and the type of work that I was doing um, was very um, was not was not uh, the best thing for me. So I thought I was going to take the time off, and obviously it turned into nine months instead of one month. Um, thank you to everyone for all of the help and support and financial support. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at about another month, and we will be able to, and I'll be able to get back to work. I'm super looking forward to that. Um, before we were, Deanna and I were looking at um, going off the grid. We were going to, um, we bought some land. Um, we had previously bought some land and we were going to move out there with our RV. We have a little um, Toyota, um, like a little tiny RV. It's not like a big, big RV. And this, this um, I think it's like a 94 or something like that. Or, um, But it's a really old RV, um, but it's in decent shape. Um, but we were going to move out there, out to the property, which is about a two and a half hour drive from here. So we'd have to move all of our stuff. We would have had to get rid of all of our spare stuff. Um, and, uh, and then we were going to live off the grid. Um, we were going to try to buy a tiny house and, um, but we decided that that just wasn't really going to work for us right now because we don't want to move out there without any money and without any, um, security. You know, the last thing that I want to do is move out into the middle of the desert and then get stuck out there. Um, so, um, what the plan is. Um, you know, we, we've been good friends with my landlord, um, which they are actually, he's actually retiring now. So our rent is going to go way up. Um, but we are, we have been good friends with him for a long time. He's really, um, you know, throughout this whole thing, he's been, uh, you know, just like everything else. Um, just like everything else, he's been it's been a blessing. You know, he's, he has been exactly what we needed. Um, he's just been incredible. Um, him and his wife. Um, and, uh, so they're retiring now. Um, and he deserves it. You know, they've been doing this a long time. He is, um, tireless. He is, uh, just a great guy. Um, great friend, uh, a great landlord. And, uh, so they're retiring um, and well-deserved and they're moving. And so he's not going to be able to, um, keep our rent down anymore. So our rent is probably going to go up quite a bit. Um, so, um, we want to stay in this house. So we're, pro so I'm going to go back to work. Um, we are, I actually got rid of my truck. It just had so many problems. The alternator was bad. Um, I needed a new battery. The front end was making weird noises. I took it to a Toyota dealership up on Bell Road um, and I-17, and it came back running like crap, um, missing parts. The hood was broke. The hood latch was broken. Um, just, uh, they just did a terrible job at that Toyota dealership. I, they should be ashamed of themselves. Um, so, uh, so we got rid of that. Um, I, we could have donated it and gotten $500 tax credit for it. Um, so someone came to the front door the other day and said, Hey, are you interested in selling that vehicle? And I said, yeah, 500 bucks and it's yours. So he bought it right there on the spot. Um, they just ended up, uh, he just ended up getting it out of here, um, yesterday. So now I have a Jeep that has all kinds of issues, <laughs> but I don't have the truck that has even more issues. So the Jeep 
Um, I'm looking forward to getting that. Um, it needs a new battery and a couple other things, but it's pretty, pretty good. Um, that the only problem with the Jeep is it has tons of electrical issues. Um, yeah, the battery, the battery keeps dying on it. Um, and, and so you got to have, when you shut it up, you got to have it right exactly on that um, off position. Um, when you pull a key out, because if you have it in any other position, um, the battery will die because when you shut all the doors and everything, all the lights don't turn off, all the circuits aren't closed or whatever. So, so, so there continues to be a battery drain from somewhere. Um, but yeah, the, the, the Jeep has some issues, um, that needs to get fixed. Um, but, um, I'm pretty handy. And so, um, I think I will be, I'll be fixing most of those issues. Um, but we do have the RV. Um, Deanna is thinking about selling the RV so that I can get a, um, a truck. Um, or a vehicle that's a little more reliable than the Jeep. I think the Jeep, um, like I said, the Jeep has a lot of issues, a lot of electrical issues, um, and plus none of the doors lock. Um, all of the door locks are broken. Um, it's just it just has a lot of issues. Um, so uh, rather than try to sort out all of the issues with the Jeep, which I'm keeping the Jeep, I, it's a, um, a '98 Jeep. Grand Cherokee. I love the style of Jeep. I've always wanted one of these. When I was um, younger and I lived in Michigan, um, well, yeah, there was, uh, we, I had a neighbor who had this Jeep and I just always loved it. I, I just, um, it's my favorite, uh, probably my favorite, um, my favorite vehicle. Um, don't get me wrong, my Toyota Tundra that I drove for like uh, 18 years, that truck, I love that truck. Um, if I could buy another 2004 Toyota Tundra, just exactly like that one, but with less issues, <laughs> I would do it in a heartbeat. That truck, um, the engine to this day runs strong. The transmission is great. Um, all of the electronics work, you know, the power windows, power doors, power mirrors, everything works in that truck. Um, the only problem was that weird grinding thumping noise when you were when we were driving it um it needed a new battery and a new alternator and um and i just didn't have the i don't have the money to get all that stuff figured out and it was that grinding thumping noise you know i did a lot to um i, I replaced a lot of parts on that truck hoping that that would fix it and i i think i think now what what the problem is it's either the front wheel bearings or the front axle it could even be the whole front axle is bent, but I don't think so. Well, maybe because if the front axle is bent, that might be why the bearings went bad. I don't know. Like I said, I, you know, I was just t done messing with it, done replacing parts, done working on it and trying to figure out what was wrong with it. Um, so that truck is gone. So it doesn't matter anymore. So anyways, um, we were thinking about getting rid of the RV and um, getting a truck, uh, a work truck. Um, so, uh, so we'll see, um, but I'll probably end up driving the Jeep, um, for work. Um, we're just going to go and get one of those, um, uh, like portable charger units, um, from Harbor Freight. And then, uh, I'll just keep that in the, in the Jeep in case the battery dies on me while I'm working. Then I can just, you know, break out an extension cord and, and, uh, jump the, jump the jeep oh okay. so um that's a very long video i know i'm sure deanna will edit some of this out um shorten it up a little bit um like i said thank you for everyone who supported uh, supported us through all this you know not just me deanna you know the people have been so nice to my whole family um you know thank you to everyone uh, for all the gifts for all the donations um, you know, uh, you made it possible, you know, uh, here I am on the other side of all this stuff. Um, I feel like I'm look, I'm on the other side, looking back at all the cancer and all of the sickness and all of the chemo and all of the crap um, that goes along with all that stuff. Um, you know, it's a good feeling. Um, still a little scary because, um, you know, there's, there's still those stories out there where, um, people get 
the surgeries and everything, and then all of a sudden they find out that they have this, you know, that it's moved to their liver, or excuse me, that it's moved to their lung or to their brain or to whatever, um, and then they only have like six months to live or something like that. Um, so, you know, fingers still crossed, um, uh, but so far so good. I feel great, um, feel blessed, thankful. Um, like I said, I feel like I'm on the uh, on the other side of this whole thing. Looking back, um, I can, uh, you know, it's just been uh, just been really lucky, and uh, really thankful for all the help and everything. Uh, so I, I'm really not sure what the next videos will be about. Um, so uh, stay tuned, and I hope to see you in the next video. So thank you for watching, and bye bye.